All right, hang on a sec here. All right. Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that would be of interest to libraries in the state um, and outside the state. Anyway, mm -hmm. we're free and open to anybody to watch. Oh. Um, <laughs> the show is broadcast live at 10 a.m. Central Time every Wednesday morning. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and then post it to our website for you to watch later at your convenience. And at the end of today's show, I will show you where those archives are on our website. We do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, basically anything that we think that may be of interest to libraries and library staff. Um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the uh, state agency for libraries in Nebraska um, and some other states. It's called the State Library. It was called the Commission. Nebraska is supposed to be different. <laughs> uh, so we actually are the agency that serves all types of libraries in the state. So you will find things on our show for public, academic, uh, K-12 schools, correctional facilities, museums. Um, really, our only criteria is that it's something library related. We do have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations on things that we're doing here out of the commission, um, specifically, but we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have this morning. With me today is Michael Stratman, who walked down the street. I did, from, up all the way down <laughs> just, the street. Yeah, from uh, University of Nebraska at Lincoln here, and he is the Access Services Coordinator, um, oh, and Disaster Response Manager. I didn't, uh, yeah, I didn't know that any time. I didn't know the official title to go with that, too. Yeah, it goes there. <laughs> you need those that. To be that <laughs> um, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and he is going to talk to us today about emergency and disaster response planning and what you need to be thinking about in your library. So I'll just hand it over to you to tell us about things well, that can happen. <laughs> good morning. Uh, appreciate all of you joining us here today. One of the things we're going to be focusing on today is, is after you had never uh, begin planning for a disaster, and hopefully you, the number of people in that category are very, very small. But we're going to start from there as we go. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, I, as I mentioned to Krista, that this is frequently a, a, a four-hour sort of seminar, so yeah. she made me promise not to go that long. <laughs> this will not be four hours. <laughs> Officially, we are an hour-long show. We are um, an hour. At 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if things do get a little longer, that's okay. So be aware we might go, go a little long. Um, <laughs> if you have a lot of questions or things, um, but um, if you have to leave before we do officially wrap up, don't worry. As I said, everything is being recorded and you'll be able to watch it later. Right. And we, we've tried, tried to do some uh, little heavier tech slides than we I normally do, um, just so that if you want to go back and review things or or look at things, the information will be there on the slide. Right, so. and the slides will be available to you with the form of the recording. Mm -hmm. We post them as well, and we post the recording on YouTube. We then do a separate document that you'll be able to download and have of the slides for yourself as well. So great. So, okay, well, we'll get started. So, well, one of the first questions I always get is, is uh, why do I need a disaster plan? Um, I've heard people tell me that it can't happen to my institution. I've <laughs> heard people say, I don't have time to do it. Um, that's always my favorite one. <laughs> Um, the time spent before disaster um, is infinitely more productive and valuable than the time you spend after if you have to start figuring out what to do with it. You don't know how to do uh, the disaster plan. Um, That's understandable if you've never had to. Never had to do it, like never had to think sure. about how to write it. Um, luckily, that's one of the reasons we do this sort of, of, of teaching and we go around to do it. And there's also a, a number of resources uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, that can help people plan to do it. No one wants to do it. <laughs> you don't want to think about it. No, it is an onerous task, um, especially doing all the planning and the preparation, um, and especially with libraries with, with smaller staff. Um, it is a significant time investment uh, to do this. So. Um, thinking that your insurance will just simply take care of it, um, that, that uh, your, your company will swoop in and everything will be all right, you'll have a new building next week and all your collections will be back on the shelf. And Very optimistic. <laughs> it is, it is. And that you can't afford it. Um, and the answer for this is that, that actually you can afford it if you do it at the beginning um, and if you do the pre-planning as, as opposed to the end. So um, we're going to talk about what we need to do and the different steps to uh, think about how you're going to approach your disaster planning. 
Okay. The idea is that we need to identify, anticipate, and avoid preventable emergencies. There's always going to be those emergencies that just happen out of the blue. Um, disasters, you know, whether the, the first earthquake strikes in your region in the, in the, in the last hundred years or something like that. But the majority of, of emergencies are preventable. Um, so how do we stop the disasters from happening in the first place? One of the biggest things people always tell me is, you know, the chances of me having a, a disaster are small. You know, there, there are tornadoes here. We're not in a flood zone. There are many, many small disasters um, that you think of. They're not always tornadoes, floods, fires. Um, frequently, it's something as simple as a water pipe breaking, uh, you know, water cotton coming off the wall or a, a window being damaged by vandalism or, or the, the, the less rain in or, or a small fire that may happen in a janitorial closet. All of these have, have huge effects on collections. Um, your popcorn in the microwave for too long. <laughs> it could that be actually any... happened upstairs. <laughs> Not our office, voice of other people, yes. <laughs> which set off um, sprinkler system, which then caused water to come down into mm -hmm. our area. Right. So. Yeah. So they're not always the big tornado, mm -hmm. earthquake, flood things. Um, they're often the smaller things in, in planning for those. Um, and those are the ones where you're going to use your disaster plan on a regular basis. And we probably enact our disaster plan at, <coughs> at UNL um, once every couple months um, in terms of, of collection damage or building damage across our different sites. So um, not always big. We need to plan for the emergency response for staff and patrons. It's often easy to think about our disaster planning as what are we going to do with the books after all said and done. Um, but a bigger question is what are we going to do with the people as the disaster or emergency is occurring that has to be included in our plan that, that we're aware of that um, and, and being able to go through the whole cycle of, of response. We need to talk about ways to prevent destruction and protect collections. Um, so as things are going along, we need to already have thought of ways to make sure that our collections are safe um, uh, as we go through those. We wanna consider how we're gonna mitigate damage uh, when an emergency occurs. So when that water fountain falls off the wall, how fast do we respond? Um, and do we have the resources at hand uh, so that it becomes a matter of a few wet books as opposed to the matter of a flood inside a building? Um, so if we can find ways to respond quickly enough, uh, a lot of times we can avoid uh, the incredibly large tragedies there. And last of all, we need to establish guidelines for managing disaster uh, salvage. So that's when, what most people think of when they think of disaster response is how are we gonna deal with the wet books or the burnt books or, or the, the microfiche that's stuck together. Um, but that's actually the last thing we're thinking of as we do these. So as we look through these bullet points, these are the things that we need to think about having in any effective disaster plan for an institution. And this is true of an institution for any size, um, from the smallest public library with a part-time staff member um, on up to the largest uh, of the academic or special libraries. This, these are all components you should be having in your disaster plan. So we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about the various components um, that you should think about introducing into your plan. I think the first and most important component you need to have is your statement of objectives. You need to talk about what you're actually going to cover, what you hope to achieve by it. This tells you and it tells the reader of the plan what's covered. You're going to be sharing this plan widely with emergency responders, um, insurance companies, they will all receive a copy of this plan beforehand. Your city managers, your, your university managers, whatever your case might be, um, and they need to know what you plan for and, and where you're going with it. So that statement of objectives is really important to, to cover those things. Now your emergency response plans. This is what we were talking about with, when you're building a disaster plan. You're often going to be in the building in a disaster mm -hmm. when it strikes. Um, you know, it's not going to be, you get a call and then you have to come into work because the building's on fire. It's likely yeah. going to be the fire alarm starts going off inside your building. So what are you going to do? First and foremost, human life and safety um, is the most important aspect of any planning and emergency response. Um, collections can be replaced. Our, our staff and our patrons are absolutely irreplaceable. So we want to make sure we think about that. 
So part of that, we need to think about our evacuation routes. What do our buildings look like? How do they go? Where are we going to get people out of the building? How are we going to get them out of the building? Um, and you can do a whole seminar just on, on, on this sort of emergency response planning in terms of, of, of how we build those. But we're just going to leave it today and that we need to think about those. All of these are building specific. That's going to be a theme you're going to see over and over today in all of our disaster planning. It's very, very building specific. You can look at other plans. You can see other people's way of dealing with things, but they're going to be unique to you. Uh, where your fire exits are, where your generator shelters are, uh, where your evacuation rendezvous point is, et cetera, et cetera. So then we need to think about what to do in individual types of emergencies. So our response for a tornado is much different than our response for fire or a bomb threat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, for instance, in my plan, we, we talk about given our proximity to the railroad, what's a chemical spill look oh, like, things yeah. like that. So, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of different types of emergencies that you're going to have to prepare for. And again, we're not talking collections here. We're specifically talking people. And now for, for those things like, you know, um, evacuations and whatnot, this is something where going back to when we were in school, <coughs> excuse me, doing um, fire drills. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to practice, you know, figure out practice uh, what is the route and you need to practice it with everyone on your staff. So if you could write the best disaster really plan in the world, put it in no. your desk, it does nobody any good, right? We need no. to disseminate it. We need to get it out there. Maybe and we need no. to it. Yeah, so that they have to say, well, this is happening. Let me read the document and figure out <laughs> right. which door I go through. <laughs> no, you need to have already known off the top of your head, I go to that door and then mm -hmm. look at the details so. when you have the, the chance. And that's a really good point is practice all aspects of it, not just the evacuation. Even the collection salvage is an important one to practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I know here, at least in Southeast Nebraska, we work frequently with uh, uh, the regional library system to, mm -hmm. to do those workshops, workshops where we actually yeah. get to, to deal with wet books or damaged books and, and what have you. So hands on, yeah. hands on, it's the only way to learn. Something else that's really important for your thing is, is who's on the disaster response team. A lot of this is going to depend on how many are available on your staff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if it's you and your assistant in, in a library, uh, you, there you go. You already have your disaster <laughs> response team. Um, but there's also resources, and we'll talk a little bit about these, um, that are around you that can be included in that, whether that's your city manager or, or your business office, things like that. You need to be thinking about who's going to, to be uh, the manager, who's going to do publicity, communications, financial, et cetera. Um, and again, that may be all of, of two or three people, or it may have a team of, of 15 or 20. It, it, it's a thing about it. And this would be the same people that you, I assume, also consult with when you're writing this whole plan mm -hmm. in response, that the people that need to be involved in it should, because that's what I was thinking about on your first slide was, well, who do we, who should be participating in this? And right. Don't just be, I'm the director and I'll do it all on my own. <laughs> yeah, it, it, actually, you can't. It's a job yeah. too big for anybody. <laughs> Um, bring in all your staff that you have potentially mm -hmm. that would be involved and especially in cities you know if there's someone within the city who you need to be communicating with mm -hmm. say hey we wrote this <laughs> right let, let, do we do it okay <laughs> the biggest thing in all this is who has the authority um, now there's a couple kinds of authority here um, the one that I like to hammer most is financial authority who can write the check um, uh, to do anything who can make the decision on where they're going and again, that's going to vary wildly with your, your, your governance there. So, so think about that. So once we get all these people together, we know what they, they're going to do. We need to write down specifically what their duties and responsibilities are. Especially in times of crisis, um, vague descriptions do us no good at all. We need exact specifications. This is what my job is and how I respond to it. We need to write it out. People are going to be panicking and not thinking. Right. We need to say, this, yeah. this is your job, this I can do that. And we need backups. Um, emergencies seldom happen um, when everybody is present during the day and nobody's on vacation mm -hmm. and, and all of that. So, you know, if your city manager is a, a week long vacation in Aruba, then who's going to write the check or, or whatever? So, we need backups for all those positions. Um, who, who's going to be able to take care of that? Okay, so the next aspect of what we're thinking about is disaster plan. We got our emergency response, we got our disaster response team. The next is our collection priorities. 
what type of collection do you have within your your, your library or information agency? Um, is it primarily just uh, paper bags? Is do you have a, a microfilm component? Is there a large number of DVDs or or CDs? Um, you know, even in some of the archival collections, there might be odd formats. Um, you know that we we need to be thinking about. Are there paintings that are hanging on the walls that are, we consider part of our collection? Um, so we need to think about what kind of collections we have in our buildings, and they're almost always more varied than we think they are. Uh, once we get down and start, start doing looking, yeah. and, uh, inventorying, <laughs> right? Yeah. What are the most vulnerable objects within your collection? Um, what are the things that you need to think about protecting? What are the things that are damaged most easily? Going through and making a priority list, you need to be thinking about things that are on loan, things that are valuable, things that are important, things that are environmentally sensitive. All of these are factors. It does no one any good to say my entire collection is super special and it has to be all saved um, because that's not, reality. not a reality at all. There's going to come a time where you have to think about what am I pulling out. Um, there may even be an opportunity during an emergency where you have an opportunity to save a few things. Um, and and uh, that's where you want your priority list to have. Um, if if uh, the fire crews are responding to a, a, a long running fire in an adjacent building um, and you're able to say, this is the shelf I need you to go in and, mm -hmm. and say for me, that's something you can do. You can say, I'd like to take care of this floor, yeah. right? That, that's <laughs> not a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so think about what it looks like and make your priority list. We have a question that yes. is actually related to what we were talking about previously about um, doing drills. Mm -hmm. um, and the question says, how do you get management to do drills? I'm assuming there's some sort of a, uh, certain people are not on board <laughs> with the fact that this is important. Um, well, in a, in a lot of times, um, you know, there's a fear, I think, of, of customer or patron disruption. Uh, you know, nobody wants to pull a fire alarm and go out in the middle of the thing. Yeah. And I think talking a lot with, with management about uh, the importance of, of human life and safety. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're responsible for them. You're responsible, you know. Yeah. You know? And without being too basic, nobody wants to be the, the person that's quoted in the newspaper as the one that didn't want to run fire drills mm -hmm. uh, when the building burned down. You know, so. Uh, PR nightmare. There. Right, yeah. we want to think about doing that. So I would encourage you to have a very frank discussion with, with what that is. And the reality is there are a lot of, of, of things we can drill for nowadays, especially in terms of emergency response. You know, active shooters are very, very oh, yeah. uh, Everybody's doing common that thinking about that in terms of training. And that's a component of, of training that we really didn't do 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so maybe starting with some of those higher profile sort of yeah. drills and training. Some of them, if you want to go through and think about uh, drills at times where there's low uh, customer and patron interaction in the building. You know, I, time do, can yeah. we do this, you know, the hour before we open where all the staff have to come in and we have to practice that? You know, sure. do we have to have um, the patrons here to do all that? Um, so, you know, there, there are some different ways to drill that you can think about, I think, in, in pitching that mm -hmm. uh, to your management. So. I hope that answers your question. If not, just, just let us know there in the text box. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about how we're prioritizing assets. Assets aren't just collection, they're the life, they're the property, the environment. Um, your number one things are the extremely important and must be protected at all costs, irreplaceable. You know, if there's something in your collection, um, and these could be anything from the the, the land plat records from the late 19th century that might be sitting in your library or or, or things like that that are just unique they're not you digitized the yeah. you have the only one right that's the sort of thing that we're going to be thinking about we have to replace um or we have to protect okay a lot more of our stuff falls into this second category the great importance you know it, it would be a, a loss um objects are generally irreplaceable um, it'd be a serious loss. These are going to be a lot of the things we keep in our local history collections or our archives or special collections um, that might have unique value um, as an artifact, uh, less about 
uh, maybe if a book was owned by somebody or had a signature or, or things like that. Those would be things that we really wouldn't want to lose. They're pretty important to us. But, you know, it would be okay. Now, the third, <laughs> and, and to be quite honest, the majority of libraries, this is where this material lies. And it's hard to say that. It's hard to say that, but, but it it's is. True. <laughs> you know, we all have a copy of something. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we're sharing it. So it's something we can easily replace. Um, my running joke for all my disaster trainings is this is where your Danielle Steele paperbacks sit, <laughs> right? You know, we're, we're sitting here with the things that, that we can go out to a bookseller and, and just have John down and on our desk uh, in a week. And this is also, I think, where insurance would come in and replacing all of your Danielle Steele mm -hmm. paperbacks. That's, I mean, you don't worry about that it's going to cost something and be a hassle later. It's okay because that's what you can use that money for. Right. Things that like number one and two, there isn't anything to replace it with. Right, exactly. So, so in your yeah. prioritization of all of this, you're going to want inventories uh, to be yeah. able to send. Now, it's entirely possible that um, if you can get, uh, if there's, for instance, bulk water damage, you can have materials cleaned and dried, oh, and yeah. we'll talk about those a little later on. But you need to balance that cost with replacement. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So yeah. there's a discussion there. And this is where when you have that prioritization list that you can have those conversations with your insurance uh, about what was damaged, what can be replaced, what can't. What's, what's the best cost. route to go now with right. the damaged items? Yeah. So, okay, the next step we have to have is in our resources. This is in your disaster plan. You need to have pages of what kind of equipments and supplies do I think I'm going to need? Where am I going to store it? Doesn't do any good to be in a closet that only uh, one person might have access to. We need to we need to have a central place to put it. This isn't always on site. Um, you know there can be you know, emergency stores off site. Um, so thinking about if if you have a a, a drastic disaster. Um, is there anything that you have stashed offsite that you can use that might otherwise be unavailable to you? Then the last thing I want to say is where's the nearest uh, conservator? Now we're very lucky in Nebraska to have one of the best conservation labs uh, in the region, just in Omaha, and some absolutely fabulous staff up there. Um, but you know, for those of us outside Nebraska or, or, or the region, um, you want to go ahead and track down where your conservator is. Um, what type of conservator mostly we're going to be talking paper but again if you have paintings or, or those sorts of things uh, where's the best person that can do that and so so this would be for stuff for are you going to talk about like computers and that kind of we'll talk about that a little bit that's a different topic that's a different topic different um, it, yeah. but it's certainly something that we're going to have to think about mm -hmm. um and that's especially important in the offsite location. Right. So, you know, where 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 are server backups? backups exactly. Um, you know, and things like that. So, and that's certainly, you know, a lot of what we're thinking is talking about is print, but electronic collections are increasingly a huge portion of our <laughs> oh, stuff. Yeah. The nice thing about it is that most of those are either cloud-based or we should have an effective uh, backup system in place. Um, so it's often a matter of replacing machines and reloading. It's a little easier to regain Just something. Physical, yeah. Um, so, um, we'll go from there. so the big thing in resources: think outside your institution. This just isn't what's in your building. Um, what does your city have available to you? What do near universities have available to you? Um, all sorts of things. Think outside the box. Um, this could be something as simple as where's the nearest freezer? Um, I've known some local. Uh, some small libraries that, that have used a, a local butcher or something like that in, in order it's to a find a place to just bring them in, and dump right, them in there. Right. And then so we want to think about that. things outside your institution. You got another question there? Yeah. So let's know. And this is a question. How do, does one find where the nearest conservator is located? Or, or okay. <laughs> what kind of organizations are we talking about there? So a lot of those you're going to be able to find um, online. You can do a search for those. Um, like in Nebraska, um, it's the Ford Conservation Center. Um, um, outside Nebraska, you can look. Uh, IMLS has some lists of conservators. Um, there are a lot of things there, again, depending what you're looking for. Uh, but often a quick internet search will be able to provide your nearest one. There are also, 
I would note freelance conservators. Okay. Um, so don't necessarily think about just governmental response or what have you, but you know, you could very easily have someone trained in paper conservation in your area that you might not think of uh, that might be available for consultation or even employment. Um, so, um, but it, those people tend to hang their shingles out pretty predominantly. It's a very specialized task. And I, and I was going to say, this, so that's actually what I was going to say. This is something that is, these are going to be people that specifically work with libraries. Um, well, they, they normally, they work with libraries and museums. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a stronger museum component to a sure. lot of that with the, the repair of artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, again, because we're focusing on items that are unique um, and, and valuable and rare. I mean, a conservator is not going to really touch your Danielle Steele, and nor, nor nor do you want to pay them. I'm sure they would be happy to at their rate. But, yeah, you know, but you don't like it. <laughs> you know, frequently, a conservator is a multi PhD sort of position, and and um, their skills don't come cheap. So uh, we want to think about about doing that. Think about where your emergency services are: police, fire, ambulance, hospital. Um, that needs to be included in your your thing. Again, your experts, conservators, or salvage companies. Mm. Um, That's what I was thinking. Too. I know I hear a lot about water damage is apparently something very it's not very popular. It happens a lot, and then there's companies that are <clears throat> their thing is coming in doing the freeze drying. Mm -hmm. your, or the very there are a couple types of drying, and, and we'll talk about those later. But yeah, there there are companies that specifically <laughs> focus on that. Balfour is one of the biggest ones. Um, they go around and they come in. They have trucks that can either do things on site or take things off site. Um, knowing how to get all of those companies in advance is, is an important thing. Um, you can even uh, do pre-disaster contracts um, oh, with sure. some of these companies. So they're like on contract with you if something right, happens. Right. So if, if there are seven information agencies that have to be responded to, the ones with contracts get responded to first. Mm -hmm. um, so the, there are things like that. Um, and those are very, very regional in terms of, of where they're, they're stationed around the country. Um, for instance, Balfour has one in Kansas, has a station in Kansas City, even though they're stationed out of Dallas, so they can respond to regional Probably, emergencies yeah. uh, faster. So uh, the big ones will have that. And then volunteers from the community, who's who's trained or experienced? Um, uh, not necessarily, and sometimes you just need bodies to help you move books around. Uh, mm -hmm. But if there are people that might be regionally available uh, that would be willing to to serve, I know. Um, several of us on the disaster team at UNL have assisted with, with regional uh, problems and, and going and, and offering to do that. So who around your area uh, is, is, uh, might be of assistance in those times of emergency. And the, the last thing in, on resources I want to really emphasize is where are you going to get your stuff, the materials, the supplies, the equipment. Um, sure, we want uh, a little bit of, of Tyvek or plastic in our in our institutions to respond to those small things. Mm -hmm. But if suddenly we were to have a whole floor damage, uh, we are not going to have the resources stored on site. No, to do you that. don't want to have that much just right. in case. Who can I call up and say, "Hey, I need 700 boxes," or you know, "I need a football field's worth of plastic," you know, or, or whatever. So uh, we want to source those materials first, so that that uh, we're not sitting there on our cell phone um, while the fire chief trying to talk to us looking yeah. for those things uh, uh, at, at midnight. So all these lists uh, for, for uh, your disaster team, you need their name, you need every way to get a hold of them possible. Work, home, mobile telephone numbers and exactly what they do. Um, Disaster response is a 24-7 job. Um, so make sure you have a variety of ways to get a hold of people. Um, and that's true for anyone, whether that's your city manager um, writing the check or, or your, your, your dean or your director. These disasters are not always gonna happen between you know 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. when everyone's on the clock. <laughs> yeah. It would be nicer be, if they did. Yeah, <laughs> there's gonna be some time at two o'clock in the morning when you're gonna need to call somebody. Mm -hmm. and they're, because they do do this and they know they're part of a disaster team, they know that that's a possibility. So mm -hmm. don't freak out that you're gonna be putting them on a list to call it to him, but make sure you have the way to get in touch with them. Well, and that could be you. When you share this disaster yeah. plan with your, your right. local emergency responders, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had a call at 2 a.m. from the fire department saying, yeah, can you come down to your building? You need to come check this out, you know? <laughs> so, going on <laughs> right, we need to think about doing that. And so there, th those are ways to get a hold of you as well. 
Let's talk a little bit about the equipment and supplies that you need to think about. And this is in your disaster plan, where this stuff is at, what you need. Um, there's a couple different categories. One of, I like to think of operational. This is just how are we gonna, uh, this isn't necessarily salvage yet. This is just how we're gonna do stuff. How are we gonna get around in the building? How are we gonna take care of ourselves? Um, you know, how are we gonna uh, take notes or write things down? That's all this operational stuff that we need to be thinking about including in our disaster response uh, package um, and the smaller kit or our supply list is a larger kit. Mm -hmm. Salvage, okay, the polyethylene sheeting, Tyvek, blotting paper, plastic bags. And we're not gonna go too deep today since we're just talking about writing a disaster plan on how you use all these different things. That's the hands-on class. Right, that, that, yeah. that's, that's a, that's a that's little different Tyvek. class. What's that? Tyvek. Tyvek is actually the wrap you see put under uh, siding. So when you see the, that siding wrap around a house mm -hmm. uh, over the sheeting before you put that up, mm -hmm. if, okay. what that is is that's barrier. a water permeable barrier, barrier, barrier yeah. that doesn't stick to things. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of interesting uses when yeah. it comes to, to wet With books. <laughs> so, um, and remarkably cheap. You can go down to Menards or Home Depot and buy a whole lot of it relatively inexpensively. Because so. for the building houses. Well. Right. So um, it, it's one of those things that, that we can do. Mm -hmm. And that's boxes, book carts, fans, dehumidifiers. Again, we're going to have some on site, but we're going to have to think about where we're going to go. Where can you go, and get, go to your, your Menards or your Lowe's to right. grab some of these because something happened? Yeah. And then the last uh, thing what we want to think about for equipment supplies is what does site cleanup look like? You know, and this is we're not so much thinking about how we're going to repair the building. We're just trying to think about how we're going to get to the collections, how we're going to help them. And again, this is going to come back to not all disasters are big. You know, when the water fountain falls off the wall, yeah. we're going to need a way to clean that up. We're going to need a way to do that. We're going to need a way to do repair things. Um, and of course, that's the the size of the disaster. Right. And not all of these things, because I mean, I'm looking at this thinking, well, do I need to buy a wet dry vac just in case for the library? No, you need to know where you can get one. Mm -hmm. And lots of places too, um, are places now you can rent some of these machines mm -hmm. um, for a temporary amount of time. You don't have to purchase one. You can right. go to, um, you know, like a loser Menards and say, I just need this because this, because they don't mm -hmm. know these kind of things happens in people's personal homes right. and in businesses. So just your, so your equipment and supplies for some of these things would be when something happens, where do I go to get it? Right. To rent it, to borrow it, to whatever. Have multiple sources. Okay. Yeah. If there's a fire in your building, it's perfectly okay to think I can go down to, to Home Depot and get a wet dry bag. Mm -hmm. If we have a tornado go through the town, Everybody's going to go to Home Depot and look yeah. for a wet right? So we need. Where's to, the one in the next town? <laughs> right. So what are our alternate sources there? So uh, things to sort of think about. Disaster plans, right? It is it is super easy to make one that is too big and too complicated and isn't understandable by everyone. Um, so use the the keep it simple approach. Uh, make sure everyone has a copy of it and they understand it and have multiple copies of the plan. Uh, now, uh, for instance, at UNL, um, we have a, a very large collection across you know, nine different buildings, including a high density facility. And, and ours gets a little more complicated sure. because of that. Uh, but still, we wanna make sure we have multiple copies everywhere. Everyone's read it, everyone understood what's going on. Um, so keep it as simple as you can though, uh, when you do that. Generic plans and templates. This is one of the best places to start. If, if you're absolutely in at the, oh my gosh, I've never done this before. Yeah. Um, go out on the web. There's a bunch of them. There's a few sites. D plan is a great one that, that you can go and you just sort of input some of your stuff and it'll start giving you the, the basics of a plan. Um, it gives you ideas about what you might want to include that might be unique for your site. Okay. But don't think that a generic plan is all you need. I, I've seen some sites where they just printed somebody else's off or made a few emendations. And again, that's going to go back to each building is specific, each collection is specific. Yeah. Um, so don't don't think about a, a generic plan is all you might need. They have to be tailored to each site's uh, needs. So make sure make sure you do that and put the time in to make, make that work for you. 
all this, you've written all this down, you have this beautiful plan, it's almost in the small bound book, you're, <laughs> you're ready to go out and congratulate yourself. Um, the unfortunate news is you're not done. Um, that disaster planning is never done. Um, whether your priorities change, collections change, uh, different scheduling change, budgets might change, all of those are gonna, gonna be an ever evolving target. Um, so your plan has to do that as well. Think about refreshing your plan. Um, if you can do it on the fly, great, uh, but there should be a systematic refresh at least every four to five years. Uh, where you just go through Put it on and just, your schedule is this is something I do regularly. Right, I got to start reading at the beginning and go through, and you'll be amazed at the number of people that have retired or moved oh, on, yeah. or, or you know, is this company that I was going to get my vacuum from still in business, or you know, make sure all the phone numbers work and everything yeah, like that. Yeah. So it, it, it's 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 an always moving target. Never ever over. There we go. Okay, so. We started thinking about this. We now know our basics for our, our, our plan here. We're going to talk a little bit about prevention. The easiest way, and I alluded to this early on, to avoid a disaster is to stop it from happening in the first place, right? We don't, we don't want to respond to everything. We, we prefer that it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, so what we need to do is we need to go through and we need to look at our collection. We need to do a risk assessment um on what might go wrong how can we fix this in advance if that hill outside your library that gets a little soggy every time it rains mm -hmm. what happens if we get a 50-year rain right mm -hmm. do, do we have a good drainage system in place you know those things like that can we can we do that in advance before the basement floods um those things like that we want to look at at the topography the conditions our, our building Look at our collection, you know, did, it, are there any problems with the collection that we need to be thinking about addressing? Um, do we need better shelving or things like that? Um, and external influences, are there, are there things out there that we just, that are going on in our town that we need to be thinking about um, uh, when, when we're addressing those? I won't spend too long on all of these, um, but some of the things when we talk about topography, oh, I'm gonna go back to this one. Okay, we think about our rivers and lakes, we think about grades. How do we get into the building? How can emergency responses arrive? You know, is, is there only one dock that's capable of, of, of getting a truck into things like that? Um, I often say flora and fauna, you know, are, are the bushes overgrown outside of our, our buildings? You know, or do we have a fire hazard or anything like that? So those real, and, and like I said, I'm not gonna go real deep into all these, but think about what's going on there. In our physical conditions within the building, um, go back one more, day. okay. What's our temperature look like? Do we have good HVAC system? Um, you know, uh, yeah, a lot of our buildings, it's okay. Yeah. You know, um, but then when it's stressed, how does it do our relative humidity? Um, if we have a portion of the building where it, it, it's just muggy all of the time and, and the books are stewing in there, there's going to be problems and you're going to develop uh, potentially mold or mildews that we then. That's a disaster. We get a bloom and then we're in a disaster, yeah. right? So if we fix the humidity problem before the mold outbreak, we're, we're never going to deal with it, yeah. So, and, and then precipitation and, and you know, that, that little leak over the, the photocopier might get a lot worse. So our building. We want to look at the structure inside and outside, top to bottom. Okay, so when we go through, take a walk outside your building, what's it look like? Is the, the, the roof in good shape? Is the siding in good shape? All of those things are things that we have to be constantly thinking about and on top of to, to avoid those disasters happening in the first place. Um, think about the activities and the use in the building, and this is all ours. Uh, so, you know, if you share with the community center or you know, you have an auditorium or there's a lot of different things that happen in the library that aren't just library stuff. Make sure we're thinking about that. So um, thinking about safety and security, uh, what sort of, of response do we have inside? You know, do we have somebody walking through or can we see everybody? You know, um, we had a we had an incident a few years back where somebody tried to start uh, a fire on one of our stacks levels and then university police was able to respond very quickly and it, it didn't become a, a big disaster yeah. but yeah. it very easily could have yeah so think and about that for these things that they outside the building the activities use 
you know, in and out of the building. This is something too to look beyond your property. Mm -hmm. Are your neighboring <laughs> buildings taking care of their right. building, taking care of their landscaping? Do are they are they having water issues that may affect your building? Mm -hmm. And so you need to look at something, look outside of your square okay. of library owned space and see what's going to come from the outside and potentially affect you <laughs> right i've seen plenty of of neighbors regrade their space to fix their water problems and it and just funneled all the yeah. water into the We're good. <laughs> yeah. yeah sorry so, you're, you're, you're underwater <laughs> yep yep so think about those things now for your collection we talked a little bit about this so we're not going to go in uh, think about unique items again it's not just your books um so think about that and there are some inherent risks in a collection. Um, you know, we all know that that certain collections and, and, and books in general are really just um, in an inevitable state of decay. Um, and some collections are more decaying than others. So uh, think about what the risks are in, in, in your collections, just in terms of, of how they're progressing. And uh, not the same as the sensitivity of objects, but we won't spend a lot of time on, on each of these so that we actually get done before my four hour mark. So <laughs> our external influences, and this is a lot what, what Chris was talking about, you know, your your neighbors, your other places around. I alluded earlier, um, thinking about chemical spills and what have you, being near a railroad or or those sorts of things there. Are you near a power plant, um, you know, gas lines, um, all those sorts of things. Um, think about civil disturbances, right? If 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 every time somebody wins a football game, does the riot go down your street? um or does it go down another street you know so we we want to know what those are and think about what those might might happen so something we don't often want to think about terrorism um and you know but that's happening now right yeah. you know just something to think about um what we do there vandalism uh, that's something all of us have to think about you know in terms of uh, both interior and exterior uh, about things going on theft of our collections all of those sorts of things are there when we do our risk analysis though we're going to go ahead and think about how likely is this to happen and then what is the effect going to be mm -hmm. sure we want to think about you know terrorism and civil unrest but is the likelihood that it happens not really we don't need to spend a huge amount of planning time on it we just have to be aware of it mm -hmm. however there's a high probability that at some point in your institution you're going to have a fire or you're going to have a flood mm -hmm. or if you're in nebraska you're going to have a a, a tornado um you know same with the building leak likely you're going to have a leak somewhere in your building i think we all have <laughs> you know we've all had vandalism and, and that's going to happen but its effect is going to be much lower so but those these are the orders in which we're going to want to to prepare for those and i think this also these categories give us a uh, idea of the order in which we need to address these and the energy in which we need to expend uh mm -hmm. to look at both of them so uh, we don't need to if something's down in the four category and eh, we need to acknowledge it but we don't need to be aware that it could happen but right yeah but i don't need to lay in supplies in my on-site storage room to, to worry about a window seal you know so uh, there we go again we're still in prevention all your staff should be trained to recognize and look for evidence when when somebody walks through and hears that little drip 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 in the ceiling mm -hmm. tile right they should know exactly what they need to do and who they need to tell um and we know can get what's those normal and what's not right yeah. you know so we need to get all of that stuff preventing the disasters is the best thing your disaster planning can do um so make them not happen water is our big one and and we'll get a little bit of you know you you mentioned when you were talking about disaster response and we always think about the water yeah almost every disaster has water right mm -hmm. if, if, if it's a leak if it's a flood if it's a fire the you know they use water you know so yes. it, almost all disasters somehow end up with wet things so but we want to look for that um, as we're preventing um look for the the water stains and, and you know especially many of our facilities have suspended ceilings we, we don't see the pipes and you pipes. can see i mean we're good in here right now right. But there are other areas in our offices i know mm -hmm. that you know that's the, that's the bad spot right. and every time it rains there's going to be a garbage can <laughs> right so we got to know those yeah. you know we, we want to look for high humidity that musty smell that mold smell we want to be able to stop those things fire hazards um this is huge for, for preventable. I can't tell you how many libraries I've been to um, where there are carts of books um, 
in the path of an egress, right? And and we're back to that. We need to take care of our people first, and we need to be able to make sure everybody gets out of the building. We want to look at that. Or the 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 twenty three uh, surge protectors plugged into one another to get down the hallway, right? We we, we want to be able to to look at all of that and have our staff trained to say that's a problem, yeah, um, and, and get that fixed. So, okay. We're hammering along here, so we're looking at the clock. Um, we're we've talked about preventing our our problems. We want to talk about our first response um, to any emergency. It happens. We want to raise the alarm, and if possible, contain the source of the emergency. Um, water fountain falls off the wall. We want to get that water shut off. Uh, we want to get things there. We want to make sure that everybody is safe. Collections are all secondary. Make sure people are safe. We need, if it's big enough, we need to establish a command center. So, and oh, let's look, my spell check suddenly went British on me there. <laughs> um, so, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that that all of our response activities are controlled um, in a central area um, so that we're not working in, in, in things. And we're going to be able to get our people together and give them specific instructions on what we're going to do. Uh, again, this is very, very early in, in an emergency, is that we're going to want to do these sort of responses. Um, some of our big things we need to secure the building um, and restrict access if, if we have a big thing we don't want additional people being injured or additional collections being so we want to get that done we want to stabilize the environment as quickly as possible um, after we've, we've stopped the source of the problem uh, we want to make sure that our temperature and humidity get controlled as quickly as possible um, and, and get those sorts of things done we want to protect our collections obviously uh, you remember we protected our people already now's the time we need to think about taking care of the stuff that we're we're actually in, uh, here to protect uh, and then of course we need to start salvaging those sorts of things assessing damage uh, we want to be able to look at the building this is sort of the, the the next step when we did our prevention look through we want to see what's going on is there any structural weakness is there lost utilities water damage things like that so is this something though i would think that um other experts out in the community like you know, you know, afterwards someone from the fire department or somewhere comes and decides, no, this is structurally too damaged to do that. Right. Because I can see some librarian, librarians, director staff mm -hmm. saying, I don't have the expertise <laughs> to know. Well, that's true. That is, I mean, I can tell, oh God, there's a huge crack in the wall, but. Um, well, we're still in immediate response yeah. here. Okay. Okay, so this is less, you know, the structural engineers haven't come out that's yet. After. Uh, okay. Right, so we're coming okay. here and. And you know, this is our lay call when we're looking at it, saying, you know, that wall looks really dodgy. I'm, I, we're, we're not going to go anywhere near that. And this wall. would go along with, I know my building, right? So I know where its weaknesses are right. in general. So I can tell someone right off the cuff, you're probably going to want to watch out for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Now, you know, if, if you had a fire and the, the fire crews are in scene, they're going to start taking care of all this. Yeah. But these are still components you have to think about. These are still questions you need to ask. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you've been taken from the building and and the fire chief comes up to talk to you. You want to ask him, okay, so is it safe? What's going on? And um, they may ask you questions because they don't know the building as well as you do. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So these are all some of the things we want to look at when we're assessing damage. Um, we want to look at our security concerns. You know, are there security systems? Is the power available to anything? Is it just a wide open window? Um, you know, and, and in case of civil unrest or whatever, we want to think about living. So, Here's a, a, a summary of some of our health and safety hazards um, during and after uh, an emergency response. Okay, and, and we won't go through each of these at uh, the time. I just wanted to put them up here on the text, and, and so you'll be able to review this later when you, you look at the. When you're working on writing up your plan, this is the right. kind of things you need to be. These addressing. are some of the things we need to think yeah. about. The big, you know, we often think about the physical, environmental, mm -hmm. but we don't often think about is the health things. Mm -hmm. um, responding to a disaster is a very stressful situation, not just physical mm -hmm. in terms of what books around, but the mental and emotional stress. Um, yeah. It's often, you know, hot, um, you know, it, 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 it's muggy, it's, it's, it's whatever. So, you know, there's dust everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we need to be thinking about those things as we're going along. So, and these are things in your plan that we're going to talk about um, as you're writing through uh, on your health and safety precautions. We're going to make sure everything is sound and safe. We're absolutely not going to use power heat unless 
we, we're told it's okay to do it, yeah, right? Yeah. Nobody wants to be the guy that flips on a light switch and realizes that suddenly they're standing in puddle <laughs> of water, right? We, we don't want to do that. And of course, personal protective equipment at all the time. Um, we want to rotate work crews. Um, so when along with getting the stress and stress and everything. So when we're thinking about our plans, what do those work crews look like? How are we designing those? Um, and be prepared to just close the building to everybody. The big one I like to put in here is never work alone. And this is true for almost any disaster, regardless of scale. Your water fountain comes off the wall, and in and, and, and my favorite example, and we're bundling up wet books. It's easy to overdo it, and suddenly you need the help. Um, and, and so, in general, never work alone on these things. Okay, our last component that we're thinking of when we do um actual disaster response is our salvage so what do we and this is the part everybody thinks about that's the thing it's all about disaster After this response. horrible thing has happened what do i do right There's, and, we, i mean we're almost through most of the hour and we haven't even gotten to right it. so much more <laughs> and all that preventative that you might never have to do this be hopefully yeah. hopefully hopefully well hopefully. you're so prepared <laughs> this, is, this is easy this yeah. is easy so yeah, you know exactly yeah. we're gonna do that so how are we salvaging okay now, this is where we're stopping the source, we're maintaining the temperature, all those things we talked about before, but this is a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. So before we were talking about immediate response, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna stop the problem here, we're gonna be okay, we're gonna try and control things. This is a long-term. When we go into salvage, when the immediate response is over, this is where the long, hard work starts. So we need to be thinking about this isn't a quick in and out, this is what we're going to be doing for some time in the future. We need to look at, at assessing damage uh, to the collections. Uh, we got to organize our priorities. Hopefully, we've all done that priority sheet we talked about earlier on, where we know exactly what we need to pull out, what we have to do first, second, third. Um, there's going to be some wait time. Okay, it may be that that the, the fire crews or insurance aren't letting you into the building right away. And you're going to have some times to think about that's the time where we're going around calling all of getting our supplies ready getting our equipment ready getting our workers so that the minute that we're allowed into that building uh, we can hop in there and be productive uh, what we don't want to do is be able to walk in and say oh i wonder where i should start that's why we've written this plan you know so put it in place as soon as possible triage Okay, those are the, the things that we're going to think about um, in which objects we're going to think about which are wet. And, and by wet, I mean just soggy, completely so wet. Hopefully, they're not that way. They're just damp or partially wet. Our responses are different for those. Are they smoke damaged? Are they fire damaged? Are they frozen? Are they dry, but they're dusty? Uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the case of a, of a building collapse or something like that, you might have damage there. You need to think about what that is. In the order I have listed here, that's in general the order I would approach uh, objects um, in my priority list. So everything on my high priority list, I would then put in this order. I would subdivide it. Um, if it's just dry and dusty, that's going to be the last thing I deal with. Is it what you need to address right away? Right. Add down to. You can set it aside and look at it in a week. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if we're in a building and you know. It's 12 degrees out because we live in Nebraska <laughs> and things are frozen. Well, that's going to help because that's what I was going to do to them anyway. So sure. uh, we're going to think about that. So that's lower down on the list. So that, that's why we got on this. Wet, we talked about everything being wet all the time. The wetter the item is, the faster it's disintegrating. Its bindings are coming apart. It's going to slip its glue. It, it's just going to fall apart. So that's why we get there first. When we do these, um, when we're handling this, once you get a book wet, we need to be thinking about training when we're writing our disaster plan for how we're handling those things, right? We have to take a lot more care. Suddenly a book that you could throw down on a table and, and not have a second thought of is going to be fragile. It's going to, to be able to break. It's going to tear. It's going to do all sorts of things. So we have to be really careful at how we're doing these. Um, it is so easy to damage these materials. Um, you know, whether they're fire damaged or they're wet damaged. And this goes back to what we're talking about, about training. Make sure you practice this sort of stuff. Yeah, and look for some of those workshops, the hands-on workshops hands -on that workshop. Michael has done or other people about how to deal with, you know, 
what what do I do when I have one of these wet materials mm -hmm. or fire damage materials in my hands and how am I supposed to actually even actually practice holding something like that? Right. Unfortunately, in a small community, we're the expert a lot of times. And, yeah. and so even if we're not an expert in it, we're probably all that's available at the, at the time. So we need to be able to get for that. Um, so one of the things we're talking about here is, is again, like we, we mentioned before, take care of yourself, take health precautions, use gloves. Um, and that's not just for the collection. That, that's a lot of that's for you. Um, you know, as, as you're handling different materials, um you never know glues there's all that sort of thing that we just don't Things need to that be, might be really hazardous that you haven't right that we haven't thought about yeah. that, that suddenly become mobile uh when everything's wet um and and what have you and use supports and 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 uh, more than one person and these are just sort of some self-explanatory things to think about those so we won't go into what each of these are but there are all couple different options available for you for salvage material. Here, we're really just gonna talk about wet, because as I mentioned before, everything ends up wet, right? Yeah. We can air dry something. It's for the damn thing. We've all done this in our facility. We've opened up, we've, we've put um, uh, fans on things. Um, we can use a dehumidifier. Um, in general, everything below air drying tends to be uh, professional. Um, you know, we need to be able to, to have a specific uh, environment to do that. Um, research each of these options. Know what they are before the salvage guys come up to you and ask you which one you want to do. Um, as you go down the list, uh, the efficacy increases, as does the price. As is the price. <laughs> you know, if you can vacuum freeze dry something, that's awesome. And Wow, that's yeah. <laughs> definitely not your Danielle skill level. <laughs> so uh, there's a couple different options. Just be aware of them um, and, and, and understand that they are. Clean up. It's all done. All the books are fixed, right? Um, whether that's a big disaster or a little disaster, um, we need to think about making sure the physical environment is repaired and this doesn't happen again. You know, was it something that went wrong that we need to fix? The big thing, um, and this does not happen often enough, is replace your equipment supplies. Um, oh, so yeah, restock. Restock, and, and that's the, the little disasters are what's going to eat up your supplies. You, you know, you're, it, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you use two baggies here, and you use three three sheets of plastic here, and then those things, and then pretty soon you you don't have any at all. So make sure you replace those at every instance, um, and then keep the water damage stuff separate from the other holdings. We're going to look at, at the evaluation materials. We've salvaged them. We, we've made them stable. We have to think about what we're going to do with them. Um, are we going to, just going to discard them? Are we going to duplicate them? Um, are we going to try and replace them with a copy? Um, are we, and, and you notice as we're going down here, we, we, again, we go up in costs. Um, we're going to repair. We're going to rebind. Or we're going to rehouse in the case of archival materials. We're going to, we're going to be pulling things out and actually have to to replace the storage containers right. for each of those. And that's good if the, that those boxes and folders protected the stuff, mm -hmm. the actual item. You only need to replace the box. Right. The, yes. But you'd make a mistake <laughs> if you said, oh, this box is going to be dried out when, if no. it's if it's that important material, just replace it and, and, and just go on there. So, and of course, with everything, uh, we have to talk about assessment. Okay. What went wrong? Mm -hmm. How did that work? How do we fix it? Um, how do we done something differently? Right. So for next time, we're better prepared. Was there something that I didn't have in my disaster plan? Um, you know, did that phone <laughs> number for the the guy with freezer not work, or, or those things, and, and we do that. So when I said update your plan after a disaster, that's ask an automatic staff. update. And ask your staff, ask the people who worked with you, what do you wish we would have known or should have done that you think we did and be honest with me tell me the mm -hmm. things that we did bad because yep. we need to know that you could have okay. written that fourth bullet point <laughs> <laughs> so um the couple things i want to say is, is as we wrap this up okay this is an ongoing process it's never going to stop don't expect it to stop every time you respond to a disaster not how large or how small um, it gives you more information um, and, and go from there. The plan's a guide. 
you know, that old saying is that no plans arise contact with the enemy, right? That <laughs> the disaster is just like that. It, it's it's just going to get you started. Every situation is going to be different. Right. You can't write a plan for everyone. You're going to be um, able to have to work on the fly, right? Adjust on the fly on everything. We talked a lot about this already. We need to update uh, yearly um, and be prepared. You know, and that, that's why we spend so much time on prevention mm -hmm. uh, when it comes uh, to our disaster planning process. Is, is think about our our prevention. So be ready for it, mm -hmm. and it's easy. Yeah. Um, that's what I got. Great. So. Awesome. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions you want to ask, we're only at a little after 11, but we started a little after 10, so <laughs> we're good. Um, type your questions in. I know some of you have been already. Um, let us know if you want to know anything more about anything specifically that um, Michael talked about today. I think this is something that's it's like many things that we work with that it's going to take time to create one of these and work it out. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure, like you said at the beginning, this is a daunting task. It's something, <laughs> but I get as I've been you know, listening and thinking about all the things that you mentioned that could happen and what you need to do. I can see that doing it is hard, but once it's done, this sense of um, so there's almost a peace of mind. Yeah, peace of mind. Yeah, that okay. I'm I'm good. If something happens, this makes me feel better. I feel more confident that I know what can what I should do, be doing, and my staff knows what to do. So it makes you feel better about it. Just like having you know a strategic plan for your library, mm -hmm. rather than just doing things willy nilly. <laughs> you've got an idea. Why are we here? What are we doing? Um, this is the same kind of thing. It's gonna take time to put it together and think about it, but in the end, it's gonna make things so much easier whenever you have to use it, and just to make you feel safer about what's going mm -hmm. what could potentially happen that you know we figured it out we got it something happens yeah good thing to do so, and uh, we'll have my contact information on this as well yes. um so feel free um you know and i'm open to any questions um you can email me or, or contact me at the university and, and i'm always happy to, to talk and as about michael it. said he does these kind of workshops to get four hour yeah. Version. Um, if someone wanted to in Nebraska contact you to come yeah, we we I'd be happy to talk about that. Yeah. And see what we can do. Um, or as you mentioned, the library systems. We have four regional library systems in this in Nebraska mm -hmm. that they made. You know, they've done these kind of sessions regularly. Mm -hmm. um, if they haven't done one in a while, reach out to one of them and say, "Hey, let's do a new one. Let's yep. do an update." And Michael might be the guy to do it. <laughs> Um, I'll try also include things as writing notes for some of the things you mentioned where people can get information like Balfour, um, the Ford Conservatory, mm -hmm. and I, as an example of one of these organizations, Deep Plan and things. So I'll include some of those links to some specific things just to help you get some ideas. About okay, it. sounds great. Um, when, when the archive goes up. So. All right, doesn't look like anybody had any other desperate questions that they're asking right now, so that's great. Um, that they that, yeah, no. <laughs> Some people have, have I'm, that's okay. Um, so I think we will wrap it up for today's show. As I said, the show's archive has been recorded. The recording will be out probably later this afternoon, as long as YouTube and everything cooperates with me. <laughs> and the slides will be available as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me see the next here. And I said, I'll show you now. Is this your last slide? Yes. Sure. Um, I can this open before. Where we have the uh, Encompass Live website. This is the Library Commission's website. You can search on our site or you can use the search engine of your choice and look for us. We are the only thing called that so far. So if you just Google the name of our show on Compass Live, you find us and all of our other links to things about us. Um, this is our main page. We have our upcoming shows, but to look for the archive, there's a link right underneath all of our upcoming shows. We can click on there and the most recent ones are at the top of the list. So today's will be right here. Um, as I said, later this afternoon, it should have it posted up there. I will email everyone who attended and everyone who registered and post out to all of our various social media and mailing lists to let you know that it's available. This is where it will be. Um, this is our archives. I'll talk about this while we're here. Year. We uh, Encompass Live. This is actually the tenth year of Encompass Live. Yeah, I know. I was stunned when I said, <laughs> "Man, I'm doing that long." So we do have all of the archives here, going back to the very first show, which is January 2009. If you scroll all the way down this, which I won't do because it'd be well, it's a lot. Everything is here. So there is going to be some old information here, outdated. We'll call it historical. We are librarians, so we archive everything. So it's still out there for anyone that want to need. But everything, as you can see, does have a date, and you will know what date and year it was actually originally broadcast. So you can take that into consideration when you're watching um, a previous uh, show. 
We do have a search feature here now because there are so many sessions that you can search for the, through the entire history of the show or just most recent 12 months worth if you want something totally up to date. And it will search for the in the title, um, the presenter's names, the descriptions, all the wording in the descriptions of a session. So any of those, it'll search in there so you can narrow down um, and find a topic that you may be um, particularly looking for in here. Um, so that will be where the archive will be. So I hope you'll join us next week, where's next week's show, there we go, where our topic will be engaging your community. Um, this is about uh, Rochester Public Library District in Rochester, Illinois. We're going to have, as I mentioned, remote speakers mm -hmm. come in. Janet McAllister's director there is going to be talking about um, patron-driven programs that they have done at their library. So if you're interested in doing some more cool, interesting, fun things um, in programming at your library, sign up for that show or any of our other shows coming up here. We've got all of our August shows posted. I've got September ones in the works. So see more added to this calendar as it goes. Uh, and Compass Live is also on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. There we go. And we have reminders. Here's um, a reminder of, no, I don't want to log in. Uh, today's show, log in for today's show on the fly. Um, when our archives are ready, here's a recording from last week's show we posted about. So if you are big on Facebook, like us, and you'll get notifications of what we're doing over there. And that wraps it up for today. Thank you sure. very much oh, for walking all the way over here and joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you everyone for attending, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye bye.